In this video, we're going to look at one of the central properties of human language, the arbitrary relationship between a signifier and its signified. So this week we're studying lexical semantics, which is the study of the meaning of words. Words are made up of two main parts, the signifier, which is the string of phonemes that we use to produce a word, be it with our mouths or with our hands, this is the signifier, and the signified, which is the core meaning and all the related ideas that we think of when we hear this or when we see this from a sign language. So all of these are signifiers, for example, dog. And when we hear this, we are reminded of some prototype for dog, some dog in that we've seen before or that we think is has a special characteristic of the category dog and of many things related to dogs. So this is the signifier and the signified. There is nothing inherent to a dog that makes it so that it has to be said with the sound D or with the vowel A ah, or with the coda G. There's nothing about this creature that tells you that it should be called a dog. It certainly doesn't make the sound dog, dog, or anything like that. And as a matter of fact, it's so arbit the relationship between these two is so arbitrary that it changes for every single language. These creatures are called perro in Spanish, and they're called inu in Japanese. And as you can see, none of these has anything to do with the other. So there is so the relationship between the signifier and the signified is completely arbitrary. The reason why we call these creatures dogs is because historically our parents called them a dog and we are continuing we're going to continue calling them a dog and maybe in the future people will continue calling them dogs. So it's just that we are trying to match what everyone else in the community is saying. But there's nothing about it that inherently makes it a dog. For the overwhelming majority of words, the connection between the signifier and the signified is arbitrary. However, there are a few subsets of words where there is a connection between the two, where the sound is supposed to remind us of some characteristic of the meaning. There's a couple of them. A very important one is onomatopoeias. In onomatopoeias, we try to imitate or interpret some sound from nature but we are, of course, filtering it through the phonology of our language. For example, in, in English, dogs say woof. And I can verify that in Spanish, dogs say guau, guau. And in Japanese, they say wang, wang. These are attempts to imitate what a dog sounds like. But first of all, they're not really barks. All of these are they're words to imitate what a bark is doing, but none of them are actually getting even close. And second, you can see that they're all different and they are all really words of their own languages because they obey the phonology and the phonotactics of each of the languages they belong to. So onomatopoeias are an imitation of nature, but they're also a word of the language. A more general term for these is ideophones. An ideophone is usually an adverb that tries to evoke some sensory perception, tries to evoke some sensation in the real world with its sound. Japanese is a language that has a ton of ideophones. So for example, if I am, if I am um, doki doki matteru, I am waiting for someone doki doki. It means that I am like tremble, like so excited, my heart uh, is beating really hard. But if I'm waiting for someone waku waku, Waku waku matteru. It means that I'm like nervous and happy and thrilled that I'm going to see them. For example, look at peko peko. Peko peko is supposed to be the sound that like your belly does when you're hungry. So if you're doing something peko peko, it means that you're yeah you're doing achingly or uh, yeah very hungrily. Pika pika, for example, means that something is clean or shiny. Let me show you how these work. For example, kira kira sparkly is supposed to basically remind you of like the stars and how they sparkle so you can say um, kira kira the stars are shining kira kira so the better translation for this would be the stars are twinkling 
but you can extend the meaning of kira kira to something that makes, for example, your eyes sparkle or makes you really happy. So this girl here is um, kira kira sonderu. She's playing kira kira because she's smiling and so happy about it. These are really cool examples of uh, from rain. So the sentence it's raining in Japanese is ame ga futteru. But you can provide further description with ideophones. For example, ame ga za za futteru. It means that it's pouring or it's raining really violently. Ame ga para para futteru. Para 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 para. It means that it's sprinkling, it's raining, uh, you know, like little drops of water. And this one, ame ga shito shito futteru means that it's drizzling or that it's raining somewhat gently. And this one, having a pots pots tekta. Uh, for something to be pots pots means that it's the like in splotches or heavily. It's for example you've seen the splotches on asphalt when it's starting to rain. So that's the first drops of rain, really heavy ones. I mean a pots pots of tekta. Many languages have ideophones. Bribri has a few. For example Yenimatke cha cha. He got the fish with an arrow. Swoosh. That the cha cha is also reminds you of the motion of the arrow. We have Namutun kot kot. The tiger runs kot kot. So with an arched back. Um, English has very, very few ideophones, but it does have them. Like to go gaga, to go boom, or she went whoosh. So you can see that these are supposed to remind you of the sensation associated with these. Finally, we have a very interesting category called phonus themes. A phonus theme is a sequence of sounds that is not quite a morpheme, but that is nonetheless associated with some sensation or some physical characteristic. And it, it has this meaning consistently across words. For example, in English, we have a phonus theme GL which occurs in words that have to do with brightness, with being shiny, uh, with being clean. For example, glitter, glow, gleam, glisten. So this is not really a morpheme. It's not really the root of anything, but it does seem to have a shared meaning across all of these different words. This would be a funnest theme. So in summary, for the overwhelming majority of words, the relationship between the signifier and the signified is arbitrary. But there are a few types of words where there's a meaningful connection between the two, where the sounds of the word are supposed to remind you of some characteristic of the word. Some examples of these are onomatopoeias, ideophones, and phonus themes.